So let's talk about the scramble for Africa. That is, who were we before the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885? This is still not where the history begins. See, for a long period of time, Europe did not have an interest in Africa. And when it did have an interest in Africa, it would only do the coastal parts of the continent. Other countries, like the Portuguese and Finland, they were already doing trade with Africa for years, years um, before the Berlin Conference. It took Europeans a little bit, you know, the 13 European countries plus the United States, okay? It took them a while to get a clue that Africa is rich and has got all these resources. And so by the time the Berlin Conference came and by the time they realized it, it was like, oh my goodness, we need to go colonize this. This is uncharted territory. This is, this should be our territory. And so the reason they all had to meet is because there was already other countries that were trading and trying to take over, particularly in the Cape, in the southern tip part of Africa, where you get uh, Finland trade that was heavy over there, Portuguese trade that was heavy over there. Although the Berlin Conference is 1884-1885, even prior to that, by 1860, um, the southern part of Africa was already taken over. Um, and the native South Africans, they were already turned into labor they were already going through um, not a normal trade where some of them were being hunted down um, and their resources were being taken, just pummeled and just, you know, taking whatever you want, which eventually led to the British and the Dutch fighting amongst themselves of a territory of Southern Africa, a territory that wasn't even theirs. Okay, remember the Berlin Conference, the scramble of South Africa? Nobody asked, nobody gave a damn to include Africans in that. This is something that they were doing on their own. So what are we doing at this time? You have to understand that Africa had a lot of trade going on, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, trading of goods, jewelry, products, um, enslavement of criminals, uh, prostitutes, uh, military slaves. Um, there was no prisons in Africa in terms of understanding what a prison is. And so people that were criminals, there was a system that they, they would be traded off and be taken off the people that were, you know, the undesirables of society. And during this time, you had the Arab Swahili uh, trade, which eventually turned into the um, transatlantic slave trade. Okay, but there was also trade amongst India, right? And that's the southern part of Asia. With all this going on, um, there's cultures that have been established, right? Africans have established themselves. They have cultures, they have uh, beliefs, they have styles of living. Really Africans living their African life, minding their African business. And so, a lot of this changes with uh, King Leopold of Belgium because he really, you know, is the forward guy in terms of this Berlin conference and in terms of understanding that he could extract so much out of Africa with least amount of input, you know, exhausting his own resources by using Africans as human labor. And because of him, it changed the entire um, trajectory of what Africans were doing, the lifestyles that were living, how they were trading with all these other countries. Because when he came in, in Congo, he was something else, okay? He was on a whole nother level. Um, I think that he murdered about millions and millions, millions of Africans chopping off their hands, over six million. Um, he's, he's, he's one of the biggest uh, genocidal maniacs that history will not talk about, but we know. And so because of that, and the rest of the European countries had figured out that, oh, okay, we can do this, whoa, let's get in. And then the abuse just went from bad to worse. And at that time, Africans were also dealing with the Arab trade and the Arab enslavement uh, particularly up in um, North Africa.
So there's already a lot going on. And because of these things that are happening, regular Africans living their lives are being displaced. They're being shifted here and there. And every time a group has to run away from the Arab enslavement and the Arabs coming in, right? They have to run in one direction. That means they leave everything behind. They have to start all over. They have to rebuild. And when you run from one area, you don't run in all your groups. It's different groups of people. So if there's different cultures and different languages, then they meet and then they form a cohesive culture one more time and then something happens and then that breaks that up again and then they separate and then they meet again and they try to form another cohesive culture. Now this is happening for hundreds and hundreds of years prior um, to the Berlin Conference, during the Berlin Conference and my goodness, after the Berlin Conference as well. This is the kind of um, understanding you have to know when we say that Africans are mixed in so many ways. We have mixed so much because a lot of our ancestors were running from one direction to another, coming up one direction, meeting up mess in another direction, right? You think that you are running um, from north going south because you know there's an Arab invasion only to find the Dutch and the British in the south, you got the Portuguese on one side here and, you know, Germans later on in the 1939s in, in Namibia. So because of that, that is why it's almost impossible to follow one route and say these groups of people came from here and these groups of people came from there. You can try to say that or you can try to even compile that, but then you always have to remember that Africans are even much more older than that, much more ancient than that. This mixture that we are all talking about now is happening in a period of time, right? One of the most extraordinary things that has happened to us Africans is that we never really quite lost our identity. Our ancestors had very genius ways of pushing on the culture, of pushing on who we were, no matter how we mixed and how we met and how we separated, how we left and how we came back together and how we had to separate all over again. And you find those things in the types of cultures that are similar between us. You find that in the type of language. And that's why they say Bantu people are a language group. We have this language that ties us together. And a language group doesn't mean that we are speaking the exact same language like everywhere we go we're gonna just meet up and speak the exact same language what it means is that there are fundamental terms in these languages that we can identify no matter where we go and what's special about being part of a language group is that it doesn't matter that if you don't quite understand what the other uh, Bantu person is saying your ear can almost hear it you can almost tell so the difference, what I mean by that is, if I'm listening to someone speaking Russian, immediately I recognize that I don't know this language. Immediately, immediately. But when Bantu people gather, no matter where they are, there's always this similarity in language. And then you start picking up certain different kind of words, right? So in Kosa, I will say Manzi, but in Sotho or Dwana, Mate, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it's things like that. And then you have our cultural beliefs. You know, we use things like um, tribal names, totem names, um, things that are identifying markers that we use, right? So for me, one of my uh, totem names is Chokwe, right? But if you read into um, African history, you'll also understand that somewhere in central Congo there, there used to be a chocolate tribe. And so when our families pass down these little names for us, and, and it's several, okay? We have several totem names, you know, tribal names, family names, and all of that. There is no one identifying name. And that just explains to how much we have mixed so much. 
And so if I was to go down to the list, I could point things from Congo, from Kenya, from Mali, from, you know, the Great Lakes, from the West. And, you know, then you really get into it. And then also you get these names that also identify you locally. So even amongst the people that are around you, the tribes that are around you, like your father's name or your father's original tribe, your great-great-grandfather's original tribe. So with those things that were forced, you know, they, 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 they forced upon us because of the consistent separation, the consistent having to um, run away. One of the biggest mistakes that everybody makes when they learn history they constantly think that people who were in charge, you know, the kings, the rulers, they act like those people define how everybody else was living. People who were not kings and queens and just regular uh, citizens, you know, completely lived different and had to abide by different types of lifestyles, right? Maybe they didn't have enough cattle versus kings who have everything and the families of those people that have everything, right? And so you see with all of this mess that's going on, that has been going on, by the time the Berlin Conference comes and it puts borders in Africa, what that does is it separated people who were used to being around each other, who were sh who shaped each other regionally in one way, and then a border would just come in, and then all of a sudden, you are this group and you are that group. That's what makes African history complicated because of those Berlin uh, walls, those borders that were put in Africa, because now we no longer see each other as the groups that we used to be we go according to the groups that were now imposed on us so for instance in south africa it's really preposterous that as a south african a person can say i am not zimbabwe i'm not from zimbabwe i am south african but prior to 1884 1885 fourth generations ago people were mixing there was these families and we see this in our language. We understand this in the ways that Shona can be very similar to the languages that we speak. That they speak uh, Ndebele in Zimbabwe too, and Ndebele is close to the South African languages too. But what that did come now is that we no longer recognize each other as this one family group that we used to be, right? It never said that everything was perfect and everybody was getting along but cultures and families were separated because of that. So to answer the question, who were we before the Berlin Conference? We were Bantu people. We were always Bantu people. That is a word and that is a term that was not given to us by a European person. That's our language. It's not regional. It's not like saying Nihilots who came from, you know, Nile River. Nobody can really tell the origination of Bantu outside of Bantu people. But we Bantu people, we understand who we are and we understand where we started at and where we came from and how we mixed and became the groups that we became today, speaking the same um, languages, um, recognizing similar languages amongst us because we lived together for generations, okay? Before the Arab invasion, before the Berlin Conference, before Portuguese traded, before Finland was trading, before all of that, we are very solid in who we were. There was a time when we are not called sub-Saharan, okay? That's a whole other thing too, is the definition of North Africa and sub-Saharan um, Africa is to imply that we, Bantu people, never made it up north, which is absurd because no matter which way you want to slice this cake, the original people of this planet are African people.
So you don't get to say that this whole entire time Africans did not make it to North America because Arab people are a development years and years later out of, you know, however they evolved and became the Arabs that they are, okay? Africans for a long time were living being African in Africa and getting out of Africa. So um, that's also another um, European manipulation in our history and the Arab manipulation in our history, okay? Arab history in Africa is literally 16, if anything, 1,700 years old. We are 300,000 years old. For those of us who understand how our history works, if you go into books, in European books, they're going to tell you that, oh, it, we are 60,000 years old. That's not it. That's not true. But we're going to get into it more. But I just wanted to give you an idea on how everything it was just all over the place and everything mixing. But there's one sense that we all have, and that is we are Bantu people. So I'm going to go ahead and answer the other five questions that I have, which is who were we before African kingdoms? Who were we before the Nile was named Nile River? Who were we before ancient Egypt? Who were we before all religion? And who were we before al -Kibulan? That will be next in the, in the next videos, but also separately. I hope that helped out. I know it was a lot. Okay, see you next time. Next video.